Yeah, so like Brian said, my name is Maggie, and this talk is about faithful endurance. So actually, I wasn't going to give a talk. We were just going to run a lot of fitness tests in order to like get our... <laughs> I'm just kidding. Yeah. Right. Woo! Okay. That was funny. That was funny. Um, so, faithful endurance is a term that I created. I made it up. It's what I felt called to talk about. Um, but I feel that the Holy Spirit is just moving in that direction tonight based off of worship and the songs that we felt called to play and the word that Brian had during worship. Um, so I just want to affirm from the front that I do think the, that Father has something in particular for us tonight individually, um, just about faithful endurance and, and how he wants to, to bear that and develop that in our, in our lives and in our hearts. Um, so this is a talk about our disposition of our mind and our heart and our soul in, um, has, as we journey with Jesus um, through this life. And my definition of faithful endurance is to endure something that the Lord is asking of us and to endure it with faithfulness. So it's not something that's arbitrary. It's not just like head down running through, but to endure something that the Lord is asking of us and to endure it with faithfulness. So um, just a little about me and the way that I process and the way that I learn and, and explain things. I studied theology in college and I also took a couple philosophy classes and that's just how my, my mind is ordered to work. So I love um, just setting things up in an ordered way because I think that there's power in order and I think that the Lord gives us structures so that they can be filled with substance, right? So before we get into the meat of our talk, there's two things that I think we should do. The first thing is that I think that we should define a couple of terms that I'm going to be talking about because I think sometimes during talks we just throw words around and the, the meaning of them can kind of be lost. So I think we should define a couple terms and then two, I'm just going to lay a general foundation so that we can all be on the same page. So drum roll because the, the terms are behind this uh, whiteboard so that's exciting. Here we go. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, wow, so <laughs> I'm a youth minister, so I, I make a lot of visuals for the high schoolers, so I just love this. So, okay, let's define our terms before we get into the talk. Law, I'm going to be reading from Galatians, St. Paul's letter to the Galatians, and he uses this word law. There's a literal sense to it in that he was writing to, they were a little later in the game, the Galatians, the people of Galatia, and they were arguing about whether they needed to be circumcised or not in order to be made righteous with God. So that's kind of aggressive. But I think that we can, <laughs> I think that we can take the word law to mean anything man-made by which we try to be justified. Okay, anything man-made, anything that we create or we do or we try to achieve um, in order to be justified in the sight of God. Which brings me to the next term, which is justification, which is to be made righteous, to be um, made acceptable. Uh, the transition from a state of death into a state of grace and a life with God. That is justification. In other words, it's for our life to be worth something, to be justified in God's eyes. Faith. This is straight um, from scripture. It's the realization of what is hoped for and evidence of things unseen. So faith, when we have faith, we portray to the world something that everyone, not everyone can see, which is our faith in God, the, the goodness of God, the love of God. Not everyone can see that. Our faith shows that to people. And to be faithful is to be full of faith, to be steadfast in the direction that you're called to go. So those are our terms. Thank you, terms. This is just gonna stay up here. So, the simple foundation that I want to lay for this talk comes from the book of Galatians, um, and it's chapter 2, verse 20 to 21, and it says this. Paul says, Yet I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. Insofar as I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, 
who has loved me and given himself up for me. I do not nullify the grace of God. For if justification comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. St. Paul says, if justification comes through the law, then there's no reason that Jesus died. And the way that we can apply that to our lives is that if there is any single thing that, that proves the worth of our life, if we let any single thing prove the worth of our life, um, be the joy of our life, um, prove our justification, our worthiness, our state of grace before the Lord, if there's anything we find worth in outside of the gospel of Jesus Christ, then we actually nullify it. And the word nullify means to make it invalid. And so what Paul is saying is that if the gospel of Jesus isn't what validates you, then you invalidate the gospel. And so this is something, there's no, there's no gray scale to this. He's being very straightforward. And he's saying that your life will either speak to the necessity of the gospel or it will speak to the purposelessness of it. There's no in between. Because the blood of Jesus was either worth everything or wasn't worth anything. Like it's either God's blood or it's human blood and it can't do anything for us. So that's why Paul says, I live, no longer I, but Christ lives in me. His justification, the worth of his life, comes from the crucified Jesus who died and rose. And so that's the root of our fruit. Um, I like to process things with this image of a tree, and there's roots in our faith, and there's fruits. And faithful endurance is a fruit, um, and the root of it is the gospel. And, and I think the root of it is what Paul says when he proclaims, I live, it's no longer I, but it's Christ who lives in me. And there, there comes a point in all of our lives where we have to decide if this prayer is for us or not. Because when we pray it, there's no going back. Because Paul says anything other than everything, anything other than our whole entire lives is an assault on the gospel. He doesn't leave room for, for back and forth. He doesn't leave room for gray scale. And so this is, the, this is the foundation of faithful endurance. Like this is the right tree that produces the right fruit that it's not me who lives anymore, it's Jesus inside of me. And another way of saying this is in the next chapter of Galatians, this is a kind of a famous verse. Um, Paul says, we are God's children. And it, that by proof of this, God sends the spirit of his son by which we cry out, Abba, Father. So another way of saying that I no longer live, Christ lives in me, is to say that I'm a child of God, I'm a daughter of God, or I'm a son of God. Like Jesus in me, the Holy Spirit in me, my identity is the root of my faithful endurance through trials. Because as a daughter, God makes promises to me. He's a father, we know this, God makes promises. As a daughter, God makes promises to me. And as a daughter, God trusts me with things. Like, I'm not just a random person off the street. I have an identity. I'm chosen. God says that there's a, there's a table and I have a place at it. And he gives me responsibilities. He trusts me with things. But sometimes um, the promises take a long time to come to fruition. And sometimes it's really hard to keep saying yes to the things that God has trusted me with. And so... Faithful endurance, this act of um, enduring something the Lord is asking of us in a faithful manner, it's not, it's not for any old tree, like it's not for any kind of root, but it's for those who are rooted in their identity as sons and daughters of God, because it's not just a matter of endurance. Faithful endurance does not equal endurance, because anyone, anyone with discipline can endure. A slave can endure. A slave can endure just as well as a son can endure. Like they, a slave can have endurance just to get to the next thing. A slave can have um, the strength to be head down, going through the muck, um, hating their life until X, Y, or Z comes to fruition, 
and then their life will be good. Like they cross the board and they make it. Their life is their life is good now, like 10 years later. That's the kind of endurance a slave can have. But if we fall, I'm just gonna have to do that the whole talk. If we fall into this, <laughs> if we fall into this mindset of like the endurance of a slave rather than the endurance of a son or a daughter, then we're falling into the law. Because we're gonna find things along the way that justify the worth of our life. We're gonna find things along the way to try to grab onto that, that we think will move us from a state of suffering and death into a state of grace or a state of life. We're gonna attribute the worth of our life to something other than Jesus. And that's what Paul is warning against because the time that all these people who they were writing to, it was a great time of, of newness and of persecution in the church. And so t- for all of us, times of trial and endurance, they, they show us something about our roots. And that's a really good thing. And so they show us something um, about what kind of, what kind of tree um, we are rooted in, what, what kind of fruit we are bearing based on our trials and in the, the hard things that we go through. And so um, God knows that faithful endurance is hard. He knows that he asks big things of us. He knows that, that trials come our way. And so he gives us a roadmap for it in scripture. Um, all of the beloved of God are called to faithful endurance, including Jesus. I mean, especially Jesus. He was called to faithful endurance. And Hebrews 12, verse 7 says, Endure your trials as discipline, because God treats you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? And I think that we have learned that through one way or another, that discipline is actually love. A father disciplines his son or his daughter because he wants to create a boundary for them to have a more directed and powerful life. A bad father lets their kids run around in chaos with with no real direction, with no real ambition. But a good father disciplines his children so that they can move forward towards something. So trials trials that call for endurance, it doesn't mean that you're in the wrong place. If you're in a time of, of endurance, if you're in a time of trial, it doesn't mean that you're in the wrong place. It doesn't mean that like five steps back, you made the wrong call. And it doesn't mean that um, you did something wrong. What it does mean is that Father cares more about your formation as a person than he does about just producing a, a result either for you or through you. So Father cares about your formation as a person. That's why he disciplines us. Paul says, if you're disciplined, you're a son or you're a daughter of God. So before Jesus entered into his public ministry, where did he go? Does anyone know where Jesus went before he went into his public ministry? What, Monica? The desert. Thanks, thanks, Monica. The desert. Jesus went into the desert. And before he went into the desert, what did Jesus do? He got baptized. Thank you, David. Jesus got baptized. So before he goes into his public ministry, he goes into the desert. Before he goes into the desert, he's baptized. Jesus goes and claims his identity as a son of God, and then he walks into the desert. And so Hebrews 4.15 is one of my favorite verses of all time. It says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been similarly tested in every way, yet without sin. And it's one of my favorite verses of all time because it means that there's no place of suffering or of doubt or of trial that God can't meet us in. There's no place that is foreign to him. There's nothing that he doesn't understand. There's nothing that he can't speak into. There's nothing that he doesn't have a solution for. And most of the times, the solution that Jesus has for us is not actually a result, but it's his love manifested more deeply in our hearts. Because in our suffering, we come to know our high priest more. We come to understand something more about what 
what he endured, what he lived, who he is, how deep his love is. In Romans, Paul says, he just prays that we would understand like what is the height and the depth and the width and the breadth of God's love. So that's the solution that Jesus wants to offer us in times of trial and endurance. First and foremost, is that we would know that he walked the walk before us and that his love, he desires for his love and his intimacy to be ever increasing in our hearts, like in the moment, day to day. So Jesus says, he says to us, as a son or a daughter, you will be called into the desert. You will. But he also says, let me show you. Let me show you how, how we do this. Because the truth is, we didn't know how to walk in the desert before Jesus. Like Moses didn't know how to walk in the desert. They complained a lot. The Israelites didn't know how to walk in the desert. But Jesus says, I'm here now. And it was not, Jesus doesn't do anything without intention. It was so intentional that he went and got baptized and then immediately went into the desert before he started his ministry, before he did anything else. So there's a promise at the other end of the desert, but Jesus says there's also a promise in every moment of our journey. And the promise is his presence. The promise of Jesus, first and foremost, is his, the, is his own presence. So if you have your Bibles or if you have a phone and you want to follow along, I'm going to be in Matthew chapter 4 for a while. Um, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4. You've probably read this um, just a couple times in your life. So Matthew chapter 4. Um, let's just see how, how Jesus navigates his way through the Bible. So, chapter 4, verse 1, right away. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the desert to be tempted by the devil. He fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and afterwards he was hungry. So Jesus starts out strong. It says the Spirit led him out into the desert. The Spirit right away was dictating Jesus' actions. And then he denies his flesh for 40 days. He keeps up his commitment. He's following the spirit. He's rejecting his flesh. And Jotham actually mentioned this during worship where just this feeling of enduring a hard thing for a long time, where I think there's this reality that we all face where we can start off really strong with a lot of gusto and have that trust and be one with the spirit and moving forward. But there comes a point where we're like, it's been 40 days and I'm hungry. Like, I'm hungry now, Lord. And it's in that moment, typically, that the evil one waits to pounce. And that's exactly what he does with Jesus when he's in the desert. So verse 3 um, says, The tempter approached and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command that these stones become loaves of bread. If you are the Son of God, command that these loaves become we can't be, demand that these stones become loaves of bread. In other words, the tempter comes up to Jesus, who is tired and weary and worn and hungry after 40 days in heat and dryness and not eating, probably not drinking very much. And he walks up to him and he says, you do it, Jesus. You do it. You do it for yourself. Work for it. Work for yourself to be filled because you've been out here a long time. Do you feel neglected yet? Like, Jesus, you do it. Work for your bread. Because in behind these words that the, that the tempter speaks to Jesus in this first temptation, behind these words is a taunt. He's taunting Jesus. He's saying, will your father really feed you? Does the spirit of God really feed you? It's like in the garden when he said, did God really say? Like, will your father really feed you? And Jesus responds, one does not live on bread alone, but by every word that comes forth from the mouth of God. Jesus replies to Satan, he's like, no, I know who my father is. I know that my father fills me with good things. I know that my father fills my hunger. He's the one who fills me. So the first temptation of Jesus was this one of satisfaction and hunger, okay? Because when he's in the desert, it's been a long time. And the tempter comes to Jesus and comes to us with the law, with something man-made. 
And he's like, what can I, can you justify yourself with this? Is there something else you can fill yourself up with? So the second temptation, verse five, the devil took him out into the holy city and made him stand on the parapet of the temple. And he said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written, he will command his angels concerning you and with their hands they will support you lest you dash your foot against a stone. I think this, this taunt is a little less straightforward than the first one. So the first one was obvious. It was, you've been out here a long time, you've been enduring this thing for a long time. The devil wants to tempt us to be satisfied with something that is, that is of our flesh and not of the Lord. But this one he says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down. If you are a son of God, throw yourself down to the ground and see if God will still protect you, if God will take care of you. And so the taunt is, after 40 days, Jesus, does God still care about you? After the Spirit led you out here for 40 days and you are hungry, do you think that you are still worth it to God? That if you throw yourself down, that he will protect you? How far can you go to prove yourself to God? He's like, do something, Jesus. Make a show of yourself. Do something to prove that you're a son of God. And Jesus responds, he's like, don't put the Lord to the test. I know that my father has already promised to take care of me. I know that he will take care of me. I don't have to start striving and doing and trying to achieve and earn the father's attention. Because even though I've been out here for a long time, I haven't forgotten his promise. and I haven't forgotten the spirit that still fills me. And so the third temptation is this, verse 8. It says, The devil took him up to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world in their magnificence. And he said to him, All these I shall give you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. All these I will give you if you will prostrate yourself and worship me. I feel like, I don't know, this is so, when you read it, it's like, yeah, if the devil just came up to me and was like, worship me. Be like, you're a loser. No, I'm not gonna worship. <laughs> no. But I think what happens when we're in these times like long standing endurance, oh, I've been in this desert for so long, Lord, I'm so hungry. Um, have you neglected me? Have you left me? Do I have to prove my love to you? Is, did I make a wrong move? Why am I still here? Did I do something wrong? But that's when the Delwi comes in and he just kind of like starts sliding stuff across the table to us. It's kind of like, all right, what can you worship? In this, in this state of, of feeling tired, in this state of, of feeling a little run down. Um, because worship means to give worth to. And so the devil comes to us with these temptations and he's like, even if it's food, he's like, what, what worth can you give to this food right now because it'll make you feel better? What worth above the Lord can you give to this person, one of your favorite people who you want to spend time with? Like, what worth can you give um, to comfort or to sleep or to rest. And it's obviously not that all these things are inherently bad, but the tempter comes and he just starts to slide it across the table and he's like, can you start choosing this before you choose giving worth to the Lord? Like, can you start choosing this thing, no matter how small, even if it's getting fast food on the way home, even if it's um, sleeping in uh, 10 minutes later and cutting off your prayer time, even if it's um, spending time on the phone or in person with your significant other or your best friend and neglecting your time in prayer with the Lord. He just starts like sliding these things across the table. Like, what are you going to give worth to more than the Lord? What kingdom are you going to build outside of the kingdom of God? And so these things, when we give worth to them, even a fraction of the amount, right? Like even a, the slightest bit, if we let our lives be justified by these things, we turn them into idols. We start worshiping false idols. We start giving worth to false idols. We start being filled by the flesh instead of by the spirit. And so Jesus says, get away, Satan. Get away, Satan. The Lord your God shall you worship, and him alone shall you serve. And then the devil leaves, and the angels come and minister to Jesus. And honestly, that has become one of my favorite declarations, um, is get away, Satan. The Lord your God I worship, and him alone I serve whether it's the temptation to what, X, Y, and Z, of whatever I just said. Get away, Satan. The Lord, your, the Lord my God I worship, and him alone I serve. And so the last piece of wisdom that Jesus leaves us with when he's in the desert is worship. 
He says, worship the Lord. Worship the Lord because he will remind you of who he is. Worship the Lord because it will remind you that he's a God who keeps his promises. Worship the Lord because it will remind you that he's faithful. When we worship um, food or status or people or anything else, we don't leave room for his presence. There's a verse from Jeremiah that really convicted me about this, and it's Jeremiah verse 17, or chapter 17. It says, Cursed is the man who trusts in human beings, who seeks his strength in flesh, whose heart turns away from the Lord. He is like a barren bush in the desert that enjoys no change of season, but stands in a lava waste, a salt and empty earth. Blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, whose hope is in the Lord. He is like a tree planted beside the waters that stretches out its root to the stream. It fears not the heat when it comes, its leaves stay green. In the year of drought, it shows no distress, but still bears fruit. So in this verse from Jeremiah, it doesn't say that the heat doesn't come. It doesn't say that the temptation doesn't come. It doesn't say that these trials of, en of endurance don't come. But it says if you put your trust and your worth and your worship into human beings or other things, it won't get you out of the heat. It'll just make you burn in the heat. You will burn in the heat. But the one who is with the Lord fears not when the heat comes. And the one who is in the Lord is like a tree planted by a stream of water, no matter what their landscape of life actually is. They're like a tree planted in a stream of water, and no matter what the season is, they are bearing fruit. And so it's not even, um, it's not even about like, f not feeling the situation that you're in. It's just that worship makes room for the promise. Because like Jesus said, the, the, promise, the promise is his presence. Worship makes room for the promise, and the promise is his presence. I love Psalm 16 because it just says, you are my inheritance, O Lord. Like, what is the inheritance that Jesus won for us? It's him. It's him. Like, Jesus is the inheritance that we have received because of his death on the cross. Jesus is the end goal. The Jesus, who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is the end goal. We're not trying to get to something in five years or ten years or even, like, tonight or tomorrow morning. It's, where are we right now? I can endure anything with faithfulness because I already have what I'm looking for. I already have everything that I need. It's like that song, Jaira, You Are Enough. I say that, I say this specific lyric a lot, and it's, I will never be more loved than I am right now, which is true. I will not be more loved when this trial is over. I will not be more seen when this trial of faith is over. I will never be more loved than I am right now because the presence of the promise of Jesus is his presence. The promise of Jesus is his Holy Spirit inside of me who never leaves. He said, I will not leave you orphans, but I will send you the Spirit. And so you don't have to act like like the struggle that you're in right now doesn't matter. You don't have to offer to the Lord plastic worship. You don't have to offer to him fake worship, pretty worship. You can be in the thick of something and still worship the Lord. You can feel sorrow and, and stress and doubt and even despair and still offer to the Lord like holy and good and pleasing worship. And so to end, I just wanted to read Psalm 22 because it's really raw, and it's a psalm of David, um, and based on the psalm, he's going through it. Uh, the language is really strong, but it, every time he says something um, like really despairing and, and really difficult, he follows it up right away with a declaration about who the Lord is. So I'm just going to read this out loud. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why so far from my call for help, from my cries of anguish? My God, I call by day, but you do not answer. By night, but I have no relief. Yet, you are enthroned as the Holy One. You are the glory of Israel. In you our ancestors trusted. They trusted you and you rescued them. To you they cried out and they escaped. 
In you they trusted and were not disappointed. But I am a worm, hardly human, scorned by everyone, despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They curl their lips at me and jeer. They shake their heads at me and say, you relied on the Lord, let him deliver you. If he loves you, let him rescue you. Yet you drew me forth from the womb, made me safe at my mother's breast. From birth you are my God. From birth you are my God. God is our beginning, our middle, and our end. Even when the tempter smears at us, even when he shoves temptations across the table to us, even when we are hungry and worn and tired from the journey, even when we don't understand why the Lord has us on a particular path, David says, from birth you are my God. Wherever I go, you will be my God. Faithfulness long term is accomplished by faithfulness moment to moment. Faithfulness day to day. If we look too far ahead, we're going to miss what's right in front of us. If we keep looking in the past, we'll miss what's right in front of us. The promise of Jesus is his presence in every moment. And so I just want to end with um, just a couple testimonies about my life because I think testimony is the spirit of prophecy, um, in that if I testify to you about how God has been faithful to me, um, I just hope it encourages you about how he can be faithful to you too. So there's this funny pattern in my life where I'll struggle, struggle, like the Lord will call me to something very strongly and very clearly, and then I struggle, struggle, struggle for two years straight, and then the third year, something finally takes off, okay? So the first one, was my job at St. Matthew. I'm a youth minister. I'm actually going on year five as a youth minister. And, yeah, it's amazing. And the first, when I, the moment I was called to become a youth minister, it is the strongest call I've ever felt in my life. I was at Mass at St. Matthew. My heart was on fire. I couldn't focus on anything other than the Lord like speaking to me and just saying, He's like, Maggie, you're called to be here. Like, you need to be here in this place. You need to work here. So whatever, a couple months later, I get hired and I work at this place. And it was so hard. I hated it so much. It was horrible. I was 19. I was in college. And I was trying to be a youth minister. And I didn't know what to do. I didn't have any of the skills that I thought were necessary. And I didn't know what to do with my time. And so after the second year, I almost quit. But I was in adoration, and the Lord just, in his presence, he was just speaking to me. He's like, just stay, stay, stay. Like, just stay on this path that I have you on. Stay in the direction that you're going. And lo and behold, my third year of youth ministry, everything just started taking off. I feel like things just started clicking in my mind of like what I needed to do. My team of people helping me were amazing. We started bearing a lot of fruit in our youth group. More and more kids were coming. And then this past year, we were just building upon the fruit of the year before, um, where we had all these kids from Gehanna Lincoln who are not Catholic. Some of them didn't even go to church since they were like 10 years old, coming to our youth group every Sunday and like experiencing Jesus. And I know that that happened because the Lord kept me in like, through his presence, he, he led me through this time of trial and endurance. Because the first two years, sometimes we would have literally five kids come, five Catholic school kids who already knew everything. And I was just like, oh, I don't know what to say to you. <laughs> <laughs> to the last year when <laughs> there's a boy, in, <laughs> I might cry, there's a boy named Aiden and um, he came to youth group and his family didn't go to church since he was really young. and this summer he's been going to mass with um one of the other kids and he told me he's like i think i want to become catholic i'm like that's amazing and so it's just it's just there will be fruit like there's so much fruit from the from the trials um that the lord has us in like he doesn't he doesn't forsake us in this and so um my sense in the room like brian said is that each of us individually, like we're struggling through something right now, whether it's big or whether it's small. But I just want to testify to God's goodness that it will, there will be fruit. Like it, the promise will come to fruition. 
Yes, there is the promise of Jesus' presence in every moment, but if you feel like the Lord spoke to you a bigger promise, even if it was three years ago, like I promise it will come to fruition. I promise that he's not going to leave you abandoned. He's not going to leave you striving and waiting forever. But I do think that Father is calling us and encouraging us, particularly right now in this, in this season of life, whether it's been a couple months for you or whether it's just been the past week, I think he's affirming that his presence is here with us, that he sees us in our trial and in our endurance, and he's giving us the grace to be faithful in it. Thank you for watching our videos. If you like this video and you're being blessed by the content that you're receiving, I would like you to consider prayerfully to donate to our ministry. Uh, one of the ways that you can do this is to go to our website. It's uem.life, as in Urban Encounter Ministries life. You can go to donor box there. And if you would uh, like to donate monthly, there's an option for that as well. It goes a long way to helping us see our vision through to make our house the light in the darkness.